This is the Mile High Five podcast with Carl Jensen and Doug Cunnington. We have authentic conversations about the journey to Phi, health, happiness, and some very odd tangents. We interview Phi experts, side hustlers, people on their way to Phi, and those who have reached the other side. Join us every week, and if you want the show notes and links and all that other stuff, head over to milehighfi.com. Hello, world. Welcome to the Mile High Five podcast. I'm Carl Jensen with my co-host. I'm Doug Cunnington. And we have a very special anti-asparagus guest. Tell us who you are, what your name, and why you have never had asparagus. I am Stephen Boyer. I am the founder of Camp Fi. And I might have had asparagus once when I was a kid. Took a bite long enough to know that it wasn't a green bean, which I do like. And so that just shocked my system enough to never try asparagus again. If we have it for dinner this week while we're here, would you give it another try or is it off limits forever? I'll give it a try. I'll give it a try. Okay. That's all we can ask for. (laughs) (laughs) And that's, I think that's all we're going to talk about today is asparagus and other vegetables that we like and don't like. So green beans. Sounds like a good show to me. Yeah. You like green beans? Green beans are great. How do you like, you like them out of the can? Like a... You know, out of the can, um, raw, grilled, basted. I don't know how many other ways you could cook a poach. I don't know how many time, ways you could cook it's a like green bean. It's like bubba gump shrimp. <laughs> Scampy. Yeah. What is your favorite vegetable, Stephen, and then Doug? Um, carrots. I like carrots. Okay. I think broccoli for me. I like broccoli, but funny enough, after we started bullshitting for the last two years about asparagus, I eat it way more often. I eat it probably like once every two weeks, I'll get like a couple pounds of it. Wow. That's a lot. Yeah. So I have a serious question for you, Doug. Like no one really likes broccoli, right? That stuff tastes like shit. Do you actually enjoy the taste of it? And just like plain old broccoli or? I do enjoy it. A lot of it is like how you prepare it. So I do put like butter or olive oil on there and season it pretty well. So it actually tastes okay. And then the other part is I didn't like vegetables much growing up. So I've tricked myself to think that I enjoy many different uh, vegetables and stuff. So hopefully I'll live longer because I'm eating better stuff instead of, you know, just not vegetables. I don't know. I've tricked myself. So what's your favorite uh, veggie? Uh, Probably bacon. Um, Okay. (laughs) No, but have you ever had Brussels sprouts? I used to hate them as a kid, but... If someone makes them right, like they're great. And one time I had some, I don't usually do this, but I had them at a place and they actually did have bacon on them and like mm-hmm. brown sugar or something like that. Maybe maple syrup. I have no idea. That doesn't yeah. sound good, but it was great. No, no, I know what you're, know what you're talking about. Um, do you like Brussels sprouts too? I do. Yeah. How, how do you like them prepared? <laughs> like there's really short answers that I'm giving you right now. <laughs> Carrots. Yes. <laughs> uh, no, I like them. Uh, lately I've had them. Uh, I guess oven roasted or whatever. Okay. That's, that's pretty good. But growing up, we always just had like the boiled, like frozen packs uh, yeah, that you'd like whatever. You get. And then yeah. sometimes you'd dress it with butter and cheese and, yeah. you know, I don't remember having any bacon on mine, but that yeah. sounds like something I might do in the future. Yeah. 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 Definitely like the, the seared kind of thing or broiled or something like that. Yeah. That's really good. So what, what's the topic today? I feel like our in, this intro is like one of the worst ever, and I apologize, apologize That's all to right. you, Stephen. Vegetables, I mean, you'd think it would be a hit, like right off the bat, but you know, you live and you learn. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so what the fuck are we talking about today? Like uh, overall, it's well, like... Yeah, we just had a pretty fun weekend, so we all just got back from Camp Fi. I guess we could talk a little bit about that before we get into Camp Fi. Yep. So tell us why me being at this Camp Fi, Stephen, made it the best Camp Fi ever. Um, was tied with all the other camp fives that you've attended um, in the past. So, uh, no, we, we had a really great camp uh, this weekend. We had about 73 people uh, in Colorado Springs. Um, Fourth of July week is, is when these camps are done here in Colorado Springs. And um, it was the largest crowd that we've had, and we had a good mix of people who have attended camps in the past and new people as well. And so it was. It was nice. It was nice. I think a lot of people had kind of a um, a familiarity with each other, maybe from previous camps, and so that kind of added uh, to the experience and kind of a little less. People may, might have been a little less nervous, and uh, it seemed like this group clicked together really quick early on in the weekend. And man, we 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 had a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, it was good. How many new people 
came to this camp the last week? I think about 20. About 20 of the 73 people um, had not attended a campfire before. And is that typical that, what is that, like 30%? Yeah, I'm not good at math, so uh, the uh, the uh, I don't know what that percentage is. It's yeah. Sure, sounds good, thirty percent. But no, that's not typical. You sh- I think we are average about half and half now. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Well, let's let's talk about the origin of Camp Fi. How old is it? Where'd you get the idea? Like, just tell us about how it came about. And I mean, it's a big event, and there's a lot of people that are counting on you. So I'm curious if you had like a background in event planning too. So big question, but you can kind of just break it down for us. All right. So, you know, a few minutes ago when I said I was not very good at math, well, uh, (laughs) my background is accounting. So (laughs) (laughs) spreadsheets do all the work. It's nice. Uh, But no, so I did not have event planning uh, background or experience before actually preparing or or, uh, getting – Organizing, that's what I'm looking for. Organizing the first camp that I did. So, but I did atten- uh, attend a camp, Mustache, in 2016. Um, for your listeners who might not know, Camp Mustache is a um, a weekend retreat that is organized by fans of the blog, Mr. Money Mustache blog. And so I was one of those and still am. Uh, but back in 2016, I was lucky enough to attend one. And at the time, for me, it meant a lot. Um, to connect with like-minded people. It was up in Washington State. I am, if you can't tell from my accent, listeners, I am from the South. I'm in Georgia. And uh, so that's a long way for me to travel. So selfishly, I was like, you know, I want to really want to go to these camps more, but uh, why don't I do one and see or ask permission to have this camp or this experience a little closer to home? So I spoke with the organizers of Camp Mustache uh, up in Washington State, they said, yes, you can run with it. Go ahead and uh, organize a camp down there in, in the southeast where you are. And so I did. And so that was, I attended the camp uh, Mustache in 2016. January 2017, I organized uh, the first retreat that I'd done. It was, and then at the time, it was Camp Mustache Southeast, and it was in just outside of Gainesville, Florida. Um, we had 38 people show up. I was shocked. I was excited. Um, it was great experience for me. And, uh, and so I was like, you know, we have a camp mustache up in the Northeast, camp mustache in the Southeast. It's like, we, we can try to get this experience, um, more easily accessible throughout the country for the different regions. And, um, the original organizers just didn't feel like they wanted to take all of that on at that time. And so I changed the name and kind of ran with it. Awesome. So that was 2017 when you had the first camp. Yes. Did you have any expectations how many people would attend, right? Uh, So you said 38 and you were like, wow. So did you have any like benchmark where you're like, this is a success or a failure based on the number? No, not really based on the number. Okay. No, I just, um, if people had a good time, whoever showed up, if they, as long as they had a good time, got something good out of it, then that was a success. Nice. What has changed since that first Camp Fi? And to step back a second, you are on Camp 38 now too, right? That number keeps coming up. Is that right? Was the last one 38? Counting that first Camp Mustache that I did and then all the Camp Fies, yes, this past weekend um, was my 38th camp. Okay. So how has it evolved over time? A lot of ways. Um Early on, well, we have more than 38 on average attend, so that's nice. Um, we have we typically have closer to 50, 60, 70, sometimes 80. Um, so it's it's a good crowd. A lot of connections can be made that way uh, compared to the 38. 38's fun, though, too. We've had a lot of fun camps we, with, with the smaller numbers. Um, but so so it's it's more highly attended. Uh, that's one of the changes. Uh, Another thing is a schedule. Like we've done some schedule changes. So I initially started out with six featured speakers per camp. So three on Saturday, three on Sunday for a total of six. And then uh, I want to say it was like in 20, 2018, 2019, um, one of the attendees wanted to organize some breakout sessions. And what breakout session is where just you kind of 
pick a few topics and then people who want to learn about those topics will will group up and just kind of have a big group discussion and share information. Uh, but with six speakers and breakout sessions, that schedule felt too full for me. So I was like, yeah, this is great. And I, I got a lot of feedback that people got a lot of value out of the breakout sessions. So I didn't want to get rid of the breakout sessions. So we got rid of two of the speakers. So we went from six speakers down to four speakers uh, to still have the speakers, the breakout sessions, but not take away from like the free time, the downtime that a lot of people seem to like as well. Has anyone ever made a love connection at a campfire yet? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think that uh, a lot of people do attend these camps uh, thinking maybe, maybe that's not their primary reason to come, but you know, it might be in the back of their mind that they might, they might meet a like-minded partner. Uh, I do, I do know that some people have like met off like away from the camps, sort of like through the fire dating dot me app and things like that. And, um, sometimes we had, we had a couple in January, two years ago, I think that the first time they might've met in person was at a camp. It's like they met like on the dating apps, I think. And then they met at the camp. So it was like a nice safe place for them to meet. So as far as I know, they are still together and it's probably been a year and a half. So, so I'll say yes. But even though they kind of were connected a little bit before the camp, but sure, yeah, I helped the camp f helped facilitate that. <laughs> right. Yeah. I bet, I bet some couple has, so leave a comment or shoot us an email or shoot Steven an email. It'll be cool to, to know that. So when, when thought about the breakout sessions and describe what they are exactly. So people have a feel, but when observation for me is I'm kind of quiet, even though I won't shut my mouth on this podcast. I'm fairly quiet, especially in a group setting. I can't seem to get a word in edgewise with all the people talking often. And I'm like raising my hand and it's just like, fuck, I can't, I, I'm, I actually have a good comment and I almost never make it. And I'm like, ah, I'm out. I like, I'm, I'm bored of this or I'm just complaining now, but, or one or two people dominate. And I know it's really tough to keep that from happening. So yeah, any any insight on that? And, and again, describe what the breakout sessions yeah. are and what you intend them to be. And then maybe you can, you know, give me advice on how to get people to listen to me. So okay. They stop talking over me. All right. <laughs> so yeah, so breakout sessions are uh, camper-led discussions. So going in, going into the weekend, I don't know what those topics are going to be. It could just be um, the topics are, are determined by the group at camp. So my co contribution sort of to the programming is to reach out to the speakers, get the formal um, talks or semi-formal talks scheduled. Um, but then the other program and the breakouts, that's that's decided as a group. What we'll do is at some point during early on in the weekend, we I ask everyone what would they like to talk about? What do they want to learn about? And so we write up all the topics on the board. People vote, the top four vote getters. Uh, the top four topics are discussed. And so what we'll have is on Saturday, we'll have two breakout sessions. On Sunday, we'll have two breakout sessions. And those are run concurrently. So uh, some people, like if they want to go to both, uh, like if they're a couple or a partner, they came with a friend or something, they'll split up. And so the other one can go take notes at one. And uh, so they can they can attend one and the, the partner can attend another. And they don't miss out and they still get the information. Um, it's not videotaped or anything like that. Super informal. But what it is, is um, it's just a, a group discussion. So within that group, say, for example, travel hacking is the topic that people voted on. And that's what's discussed. We have a number of attendees at every camp that is very familiar with travel hacking, credit card bonuses or credit card points and, and that type of thing. Um, so someone who knows about the topic uh, will typically volunteer to be the facilitator. So like you said, sometimes it's like it can be dominated by, you know, one, one or two people and everybody else just kind of sitting there. Uh, that's not the point of the breakouts. The points of the breakouts is just to, or the facilitator's job during the breakouts is just to facilitate, to make sure that everyone 
gets a say and that it is not dominated. Now, sometimes just naturally, depending on the topic, you might have somebody that's like a great mm -hmm. communicator that's very good at disseminating information and everybody just keeps asking the same person. You know, that's that's kind of like how it naturally happens sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, but as a general rule, I, th I think the way we've had it um, is there's not too many that are dominated. I think it's whoever the facilitator is, is a, does a good job of including everybody and making sure everybody can contribute to the discussion. Doug, I think the answer is you should facilitate and just take over the whole thing. You can just go up there. It would be like a presentation. It was supposed to be a breakout <laughs> session, but you just talk the whole time with a minute for questions at the end. That's a, that's actually a pretty good idea. I was going to say the best breakout session I went to, I facilitated. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, understandably, <laughs> right. And that, and did you get the attention from everybody? Did you get up and like dance in the middle of the in a circle or is that because you ask the question, how do you get, how do you get noticed? How do you get noticed? That could be something that you could do. That is good. Yeah. I was going to say now I, I just need personal tips on how to get people to listen to me. Oh, That's personal all. tips. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But speaking of dancing, this past Camp 5, there was actually a lot of dancing. There was a, a little uh, kind of a group dance lesson situation happening. And uh, shout out to Alex. I, what's Alex's last? Uh, we'll just say Alex. Alex M. Alex M. Excellent salsa dancer. The guy had moves. He was amazing. He's out of, you know, the we'll say Colorado area. And then Rachel Richards. She has been studying salsa. I have been studying uh, some dance, but I'm not. Um, I'm not very good. Oh, you're being modest. No, thanks, thanks. But but you got out there, so I'm curious. Uh, has there been any other like group dance lessons in the previous you know 30 plus campfires out there? No, sir. This was a first. Cool. Well, what would you think of it? Do you want to do that again? Yeah, I mean, it was it's, again. It's like one of those like it's just. Um, Things are decided or dictated by the the group, and yeah. this wasn't something that I'd planned. It was just sort of salsa became a theme at introduction. Someone's like, "Hey, I like salsa," and somebody else was like, "Yeah, me too," and me too. And then it just kind of like organically happened. Right. Um, I don't know that I'd I'll make it like a formal part of the programming because yeah. you know what if I did that and nobody likes salsa and they're like, "No," but like it was fun. Like would want to do it. Like personally, I would love to do it. It was and cool. learn more. Yeah, it was great. And Alex was great. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and shout out to Gabby also. Yes. She, another actually super experienced dancer. And um, yeah, we just try to keep up. Now, you were out there. I was out there a little bit. We switch partners. You hang out. You know, you get to meet people. Carl, why didn't you dance out there, man? Everybody was out there. I was just, sometimes you just like to sit back and listen or observe. And that was my role in that event to... Uh, um, I'm a lover, not a dancer, Doug. <laughs> okay, fair enough, fair enough. Okay, so let's talk about some some challenges. So you started Camp Fi 2017. It's been a success. It's been growing. You have uh, made it through a pandemic, right? So that's pretty tough for the live event business. And just generally, ex you've managed expansion without overexpanding in it seems like everything's going well. People come back, which is probably like the, the best sign that you're doing a good job. What challenges have you run into over the years? Um, I, no challenges. It's been super like <laughs> easy and simple. And, uh, no. So, so I think with any business you have, uh, if, especially if you're starting a new business, like, like I said earlier, my background was in accounting. I work in an office in a cubicle at a computer. I'm not running uh, like retreats. And, uh, so, so that was all new to me. So I guess the challenge was sort of overcoming, like, can I do this? Um, but really what I did is I just initially sort of created, I used the camp mustache as a template and tweaked it a little bit. And so that was nice. And, and after doing it once and just kind of overcoming all the nerves and everything and seeing that, you know, that Saturday night, people are actually still having a good time and people aren't like leaving and, uh, I was like, okay, yeah, so I can do this. And so so that was one of the things that I overcame was my, my initial uh, maybe doubt that, that I could be successful at something that I haven't had experience in. Uh, but over time, yeah, so so some some other, man, I feel like I'd, I'd be complaining if I'm sitting here saying things that I have trouble with. But um, 
What about mistakes? Anything go wrong where like there wasn't enough food or there wasn't a vegan option and you were supposed to have it or ju just oh. any mishaps that came up as well? Yeah, like I really, there really hasn't been anything big. I will, I mean, we can talk about the the effect on the camps, um, mm -hmm. the pandemic. I mean, that was, sure. that was a little tough. I think at that time, before the pandemic happened, I was planning on doing uh, two weekends in Virginia because before it was very highly attended. And I was like, oh, maybe there's a demand in that area for for more than one camp. And so we did two weekends scheduled and, and we had a lot of tickets sold and everything. And then the pandemic happened and, uh, you know, refunded all those. Um, and then they we ended up not doing one that year at that location. And... Um, and even like different states had different kind of rules back then. I don't know. I know I feel like right now it feels like all oh, that was so long ago, but it really wasn't. Um, so I kind of have to refresh my, my memory. But um, we had like different states had different rules, right? Like Georgia. I don't know that people really believe the pandemic existed in Georgia. You could um, do any. I remember flying there during the pandemic and it was like, everything's cool. Like nothing yeah. was going on. Yeah. Yeah. And um so Colorado, you know, stayed at the time they they did allow us to to still have the retreat. So I was constantly concerned about like because it was like politically charged and things like that. I was kind of concerned. I was like, what am I gonna get any any pushback or negative feedback or whatever from you know, the FI community uh if I do have these uh, retreats, you know, because is still potentially a risk for you know, but we did we we followed the rules that each state had, that each retreat center had, um, and I think the way I looked at it is like pretty we're all grown ups, you know. If you have a concern about it, then don't attend, and that's fine, completely fine. Um, and 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 some people like even in when it wasn't required for us to wear a mask, um, so some people would still wear masks and distance and some people wouldn't and we had some like uh, one of the things i did is i did red and green bracelets and so that way there wasn't like this weird awkward exchange we're like hey are you okay to be close to can i come in for a hug or you know whatever it is mm -hmm. it was uh you could just i could just look at your wrist and say oh he's got a red wrist uh wristband what, what, what would that mean yeah that would mean like you want me to keep my distance okay from you Right. Oh. So, so I didn't, you don't want me to get uncomfortably close to you, but green means like you're okay with anything goes. Know, well, I don't know about anything, <laughs> but, but yeah, but yeah, like you could, you know, hug or shake hands or whatever. All right. Um, high five and, uh, but yeah. And so, but I, we, I never saw an instance where like someone was wearing a mask and was shaming someone that who didn't wear a mask or someone who didn't wear a mask shamed someone who did. It was never yeah. like that. And so, um, but we navigated all those things and we, you know, kept campfires going when we could. And, and I was wondering, uh, like now that we're way past it, yeah, I, we know the, I know the answer to this, but at the time I was like, is this sustainable? Is it the momentum? Cause up to that point, like campfire was growing pretty quickly. And uh, I was wondering, are we going to be able to get that momentum back and, and be able to fully like have all of our retreats again? Uh, but I mean, it, it's, it's back stronger than ever. So that was, this is twenty twenty three now 2022 was uh we had more people attend a campfire in 2022 than we had ever before so um that answers that question so it was it was we worked through it it was all good and everybody was grown ups about it um and i'm excited to see that uh hopefully the pandemic and everything the worst of it's behind us and we won't have another one hopefully for a long long time if if ever and then uh, like people in the fi community and personal finance and all they they have this option to be able to go and and enjoy each other's company. Do you still have any of those red wristbands laying around? I might be able to use one for Doug. <laughs> yeah, we can get, I'll get you one. Okay, thank you. Yeah, appreciate you're it. You're welcome. Yeah, I was going to say, can we just wear those in regular life? And then, because <laughs> <laughs> people try to touch me all the time is the thing. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I get it. Yeah, it must be what I wear. <laughs> it is. So, I mean, so. yeah. A couple other things, and, and we didn't mention it earlier, but we will be transitioning over to like talking about co-housing as well. But as we um, kind of wrap up, uh, two main areas that I want to ask about Camp Fi, and Carl, if you have something else too, we can throw that in. But are there any changes on the horizon, any new locations, any changes in formatting or anything like that? Or is it kind of, you know, a, a good 
spot where it's at and you like to maintain it. Yeah, I will say it's a good spot where it's at. Like I'm happy with how things are now. Um, I've always said I want to do as many camps as there is demand for. Uh, so, so expanding and growing and maybe like right now, the two main regions in the United States that we don't have a camp is Northeast and the Pacific Northwest. And now we have a Camp Mustache up there in the Northwest. So if we do go to expand, it would be in the Northeast next. Um, and then maybe the Northwest after that. But I'm happy with how things are now. Uh, I was thinking of maybe this year would be the first year that we would have a Northeast one, uh, depending on like how fast tickets were able to sell out for the existing camps if the, and that would signal that there was a lot of demand and so that we could i could risk maybe expanding one more camp uh i just it didn't feel like that was the, where it was at this year so i didn't do one but maybe next year we'll do a, mm -hmm. a northeast if i may challenge you on that the geography may have something to do with it so i think you may maybe you still have plenty of demand in the northeast and you would be able to sell it out this is based on absolutely no information other than you could try it out. I guess there's a lot of preparation that you would have to do ahead of time, mm -hmm. but I bet there's a demand. I mean, there's a huge population in the Northeast. So my hunch is there is demand, but some people don't want to fly like, you know, several hours away or take a flight. They just want to drive a few hours. So right. any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah. So if I start, uh, if I know that the, the camps that I currently have in place are going to be sold out and, you know, financially sustainable, Moving forward, then I will. I, I definitely will um, do one in the Northeast, but uh, I don't know if I want to do one in the Northeast, and then it may be potentially negatively impact the attendance at the ones that I have um, in effect. But then again, like you say, there's a it's a nice population center up there. It may not hurt it at all. Yeah. 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 I don't know. It's easy for me to say. So, all right. The other thing is. You know, what should people expect if they haven't been to a Camp Phi before? And I've talked to people, they're like, I'm a little nervous. This whole thing seems a little culty. <laughs> and I'm introverted, right? People are like, I'm introverted and I don't know if I can do 72 hours of just like constant interaction. So what should people expect? And, you know, maybe if they're introverted, do you have any tips for them? Yeah. Yeah. So expect a Friday uh Friday late afternoon check-in. It's going to go from Friday evening through Monday morning, typically. Um, well, that's what, always the schedule, but uh, if, if you need to leave early or whatever, that's cool. It's super informal. So uh, Friday is check-in, eat dinner, uh, and introduce yourself. And then it's just kind of chill for the rest of the night. Saturday and Sunday is you'll go to breakfast. And you'll have a couple presentations. This is the typical uh, schedule. You go to breakfast around eight o'clock in the morning, have a couple presentations in between breakfast and lunch. Um, and breakouts would be after lunch. And then we'll have free time after that between the breakouts and dinner. And sometimes we might have a little bit of programming. Like I know that you guys have, um, has, have prepared or presented and done a lot of, uh, number of recordings at this point, we will interview, um, attendees or other, speakers you know on your podcast here and i recommend all your listeners check those out because they're always pretty fun yeah. um and then monday morning is just kind of like checking out of your rooms turning in your keys if you have them uh maybe getting some some photos with some people that you you met sharing information and just kind of heading on your way back back to uh back home but to those people who are introverts, um, I will say two things. One, I've had many people come up to me and say, I'm an introvert, but whenever I'm in this group, it's so easy to talk to people. And so that's great. So if you're an introvert out there and you are concerned about like interacting with people, take that um, take that with you and say, you know, maybe, maybe it'll be the same way for you. But the other thing is if you're an introvert and you don't wanna talk to people, because there are a lot of talking and a lot of social interaction, um, it can be draining for an introvert, but we have so much free time built in. Like, like I've gone, like even as the organizer, uh, organizer, there have been a few camps where I've gone and taken a nap in the middle of the day, um, and it, it's no big deal. So, uh, there's plenty of space in the schedule in the weekend for you just to take a walk, go take a nap, read a book, you know, whatever. Have your have your own time and recharge your batteries. Yeah. So so. 
I think, again, for introverts, uh, I can understand your concern about going to a retreat for a long weekend with, you know, 50 to 75 people, maybe. Uh, but the but the data, the, mm -hmm. the un, I guess, the anecdotal data that I have says that um, introverts in general do very well and, and have a good time. Yeah. One other comment I'd like to make, Stephen, is for some reason, I've heard multiple people say this. Usually they contact me through the blog and say, I'd really like to come to this Camp Fi thing, but I'm not a content creator. So they have the perception that it's like a FinCon that is just for bloggers or people like that. And it is the exact opposite. This is for people who just want to hang out with people who they think are more like them. There happen to be some content creators at these things, and sometimes they'll give a presentation or lead a breakout session, but almost everyone there has no presence on the internet. They're not trying to start a blog or do anything like that. They're just um, normal people who like the FI stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm, I'm not a content creator either, you know, so, uh, I was your regular nine to five. Whenever I found the five community, I was your regular nine to five person and, you know, family life and, you know, doing the dad thing and, you know, got to do dishes, got to, you know, you, you're, you're just like a normal person. So uh, you don't have, or me, I don't have this online persona or anything like that. So, uh, so yeah, so this, there wasn't really a question there that you asked. You were just kind of saying that, but, but yeah, so this is for, anyone really we do have content creators which is cool uh, and then but yeah the majority of people are just just folks who don't have really online presence or uh, like they're not like pushing their businesses or anything like that it's just uh, like personal networking more than it is business networking mm -hmm. yeah and it's like 95 percent just non-content creators so yep. okay and actually, as we're transitioning here, I will say you are a content creator, Stephen. You have a YouTube channel, so we'll link up to that. People could check it out. They could actually watch the presentations that you've been recording for a little while. And there's a little bit of a queue, but there's plenty. How, how many are out there now? Uh, right now I have 24, but I have probably another 24 in the queue, but I got to get around to editing and posting. But uh, there's plenty of content there now for people who haven't checked out the, the YouTube channel. And uh, when I say I'm not a YouTube a content creator is not me. It's not. My, I'm just recording it, right, and putting it out there. It's um, the speakers are really the creators of that content, but not to you know get into an argument with you. Fair so. enough. We're just trying to plug your channel. So. Thank you. All right. So as we're transitioning over to the co housing, we actually have a new sponsor. Very happy that this worked out. I've been in negotiations for actually a few months, and we have a live read here. So I'm going to turn it over to you guys. Are you sick and tired of the stench that lingers after you enjoy some delicious asparagus? Well, fear not, my friends. Introducing P-Rid, the mind-blowing prescription drug that wipes out asparagus pee and leaves your bathroom smelling as fresh as a daisy. Do daisies smell? I guess they do. <laughs> no more nose pinching or awkward encounters. But hold on tight, folks, because P-Rid comes with its fair share of side effects. Brace yourselves. Side effects may include... <laughs> Neon colored urine spontaneously breaking into salsa dance routines at the grocery store, speaking fluid dolphin, be careful, near the beach, and developing an uncanny ability to juggle potatoes in your sleep. Keep in mind, folks, that ordinary heavy machinery while under the influence of PRID might result in extraordinary feats of strength, bouts of uncontrollable laughter at serious moments, and a sudden and inappropriate attraction to garden gnomes. <laughs> Oh, that's where that came from. I was worried about myself. Okay. Absolutely, Stephen. And remember, p -Rid may not be suitable for everyone. If you have an aversion to rainbows, are allergic to Taylor Swift songs, or find yourself repelled by the use of question marks, consult your doctor before diving into the world of p -Rid. So, my friends, if you're desperate to bid farewell to the asparagus-induced aroma, don't hesitate to ask your doctor about p -Rid today. Embrace a life free from the tyranny of asparagus pee. Because life is just too short for stinky pee. All right. So just talk to your doctor. They'll be able to point you in the right direction if you're interested in P. Ritica. And uh, you can check out the Buy Me a Coffee page if you're interested in supporting the show. All right. So let's transition. That's a great way to open up 
for co-housing, I don't you so. think? Yeah. It's, it's just what you were thinking. It's a natural planning. transition here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So can you introduce the topic of co-housing and we'll kind of get into what you're working on these days? Okay. Yeah. So, so disclaimer, I'm not a co-housing expert. Um, uh, earlier in this interview, I said that I attended a Camp Mustache in 2016 during that uh, experience. Uh, I don't know if Marla Tain, have y'all ever had Marla on your show? Okay. Nope. So um, Marla led a breakout session in which she talked about co-housing. And it was like a really cool idea. Um, and so I was attracted to the idea. I thought it'd be a great um, thing to try to create and encourage. Uh, so and I'll, I'll get into what it is in a minute, but um, so I came after, after she introduced me the topic to me, I came back home from the camp and re- did some research. And I was like, oh, this would be a really cool thing. So what it is, is um, the way I like to explain it. And again, I'm not an expert. This is just as I know it. Uh, I, I consider it, I explain it as an efficient neighborhood. So uh, it seems like the typical sort of trend or American way is uh, we kind of move further and further away from each other. We know our neighbors less and less. We sort of live our lives inside our houses and we might wave to our neighbor as we're pulling out of our driveway to go to work or we're coming home from work. We really don't have a lot of social connection with our neighbors. Now, our family members, you know, we tend to, uh, I think, compared to the way things used to be, we've sort of moved further. Our families are more dispersed as well. So with those things combined, as we, we sort of um, are moving in the wrong direction as far as being socially connected. And so the thing about the co-housing is it's a neighborhood or a community that is specifically for people who want to sort of go in the other direction and live a connected life um, and support each other and um, be supported, you know, in times whenever we need support. So um, it looks a lot like a regular neighborhood, a regular community. uh, I'm sorry, it looks a lot like a regular neighborhood where each person would own their own homes and they're typically smaller uh, than average. And you might have shared spaces and shared amenities, like a commu- you would definitely have a community house. That's sort of the, the main staple with co-housing and where maybe once or twice a week, the community will get together and have dinner and hang out and just talk, chit chat, whatever. What, what was your, uh, you had to get together and you say you could talk about your hopes and dreams. It was, it was a funny email, hopes and dreams, laugh, cry. Whatever. And I was like, okay, yeah, that's cool. I don't know if you remember your actual, actual wording of that email, but it made me laugh. Yeah, I had a bunch of goofy things on there, none of which I remember right now because oh, okay. I'm so tired from Camp Five. Yeah, but. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's just kind of people who might feel a little isolated um, and want something different. So they'll reach out um, and either form co housing communities or they can go and find one of these types of communities that are already in existence and, you know, research whatever works for them and location. And, um, and then just, they, it's a, it's a more, it's an option that's sort of um, different than what the norm is now. So for those people who don't want something different than the normal, you know, they can check out co-housing. Do the co-housing community, is, would that be the right term to use? Co-housing community, yes. So a co-housing community, does it have a theme? So we'll talk about the project that you're working on, but Mm -hmm. maybe people are really into cooking and it's like a whatever organic gardening focus and just like farm to table kind of ideas. And it's all about the food. So do they typically have a theme or something like that? Excuse me. I don't know if uh, if they typically have a theme that is so specific to like cooking or certain painting or hobbies or things like that. No, um, I th- but I do think that there's a general theme among all of them is one, it's social connection. That's like the main thing. Uh, and then the others would be maybe uh, a more environmentally friendly footprint. Um, 
you know, efficient. You'll have uh, so like sometimes they'll have solar um, heat pumps, you know, just things like that, kind of a smaller footprint. Uh, so that's kind of a typical shared value and maybe a reason someone would want to do something like this. Um, someone that just they can like be in a group with people who live more in line with with their values. Now, I, I don't know of any co-housing that's just like, you know, comic book artists just want to get together and, and like hang out. So I don't think it's that specific. Uh, but I think just just the main thing is the social social connection. So you're actually working on one of these communities. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. So after attending um, and learning about after Marla had introduced the concept, I was like, okay, I'll learn some more. Went and bought a couple of books, learned that uh, there's some people back in maybe the late seventies, early eighties, went to Denmark, was exposed to this type of living and that they've made it sort of their own mission and they've built their business around uh, back in the United States of increasing the number of co-housing um, communities here. So, uh, so if you have never heard of co-housing, there's a chance that you actually have one in your state or maybe somewhere close to you. You just might not know. So I, right now, I just want to say cohousing.org is a good resource if you're looking. Um, that's just cohousing.org. Uh, if you want to check out a directory and see where they are for you. Uh, but I am working uh, on on a co-housing community in Georgia. So if you go to the directory, you look up Georgia, you'll see that there are actually two co-housing communities in existence already in Atlanta. I think one might be uh, about 60 units. And I have toured that one. There's another one that I think is like 12 to 15 uh, houses. I have not checked that one out yet. Uh, but I am. I think that that's a great... To me personally, I think I want it. That's a way for me to contribute to try to make the world better in a way that I... I believe. So I would like to do a co-housing community in my hometown, um, which is Warner Robins, Georgia. It's W-A-R-N-E-R, -E and it's R-O-B-1-B-I-N-S. Um, so it's about an hour and a half south of Atlanta, right in the middle of the state. And so my idea is to purchase existing homes uh, that are in close proximity to each other. And then once we have those homes, kind of put out the idea of co-housing either in the local area and or um, th it would be great if it was, you know, Phi community or people. Um, but really, again, it doesn't have to be a Phi specific community. It could just be people who want to be really good neighbors and connected. Uh, but yeah, so that's, that's my, my plan. Uh, the way I understand it is co-housing a lot of times is where you'll have the people first People will, like over the years, you'll say, hey, I have this idea for co-housing. Anybody interested? Over time, that community sort of builds. And then uh, once that community builds, it's not the non-physical community. So then there's no houses or anything, no development, but they have the people and they're building that community of people. And they together will decide like where specifically they want it. So they have to go buy the land. They have to make all these decisions with roads and plumbing and sewer and electrical run. And, you know, what do they want, what do they want their houses to look like? Um, what sort of amenities do they want to share? That's a lot of decisions for a lot of people to come together and sort of decide on. And whenever I was reading this, I was like, man, that sounds exhausting, you know? So I was like, well, I'll try to do it the other way around. Like, I'll try to get the houses first. And say, well, this is what is available. Um, and then whenever we have enough houses, <clears throat> sort of cast the net out there, put the idea out there and see if there are people interested in it. And that would to me seemed like a, uh, a quicker way to go from the idea of co-housing to actually having an existing. And because we're using existing houses, um, that's called that's a term called retrofit co-housing versus just building from the ground up where everything's new construction. Yeah, one interesting thought I've had, Stephen, and I don't know if you've thought about this, but here in Longmont, we kind of have two very, very small but budding co-housing co situations. One is where Mr. Money Mustache lives. Uh, two of his neighbors are have also been hosts on the Mile High Five podcast. Those are Amberly and Dusty, and there's actually a fourth person who lives right on the same street there. And I moved to my neighborhood because of someone I met through the Phi neighborhood, and since then, two other people have moved in. So we each have about at least four people in our, 
intentional communities or I think it's kind of unintentional. Someone we had friends that are like, Oh, your street looks pretty nice. I want to move here. Let's move here. And of course, working from home makes it easier. And it it's pretty neat because it works out kind of how you describe Stephen. For example, tonight I'm having two of those people. So I mentioned there's four in my community and my little neighborhood and two of them are coming over to our house for dinner. So three out of four, including myself, it's pretty neat though, but this is uh in your case, it's a long game. You have to acquire these houses, right? And I, I think you've tried to acquire some of them off market. And do you care to comment on the progress of where you're at now? Uh, sure, sure. First of all, yeah, I've, I've seen firsthand your community here, and it's really great. You know, we had a get together uh, yesterday or for Fourth of July weekend, and you had a house full of folks, and some of them, it was cool that you could just like walk down the street mm -hmm. um, and be at your houses. You know, you don't have to get in the car, drive 40 minutes. Um, you know, all the kids are playing together, and, you know, it was, it was a beautiful thing. And uh, yeah, so I really like what you guys have done and are doing uh, in your neighborhood. Yeah, that's it's it's great. Um, so the status of of what I'm where we're at now is we have a neighborhood in Warner Robins, and uh, Warner Robins, Georgia, and it's a neighborhood of ninety nine houses, and myself and a number of other uh, people in the Phi community have purchased uh, twenty total houses in this community or in this neighborhood. And my vision is that it has always been as, as when we get to 20 houses, uh, we'll kind of float the idea out there and see if there's a demand for the co-housing community idea. And so we are at that point now. And so that's one of the reasons why we're talking about it now. I've, I've, I've had talks about this, like, like one-off side conversations at camps over the years and everything. But just this year, now that we're at the 20 houses, have I started talking about it sort of more on a broader scale. Um, and we've had some interest, but, but where we are is we have the houses and now we're looking for the people. And you're going to, you mentioned you're going to sell these houses to people interested in it. Is that correct? It is. It is. And it could be, ideally it would be owner occupied houses and, um, but we're not, a, me and the other investors are not opposed to a rental situation. If somebody wanted to come be part of the community, but just didn't want to buy for some reason, um, you know, they could establish a, a rental agreement, just like any other rental agreement. Um, and then the expectation is that they would, they're there for the community and they would participate. So yeah, rentals, renting is an option as well. Okay. And one final question, what rules do you put around it to maintain the co-housing uh, ethos? I guess like, let's say Doug comes in there and buys one and then Doug gets an offer from someone else. How do you ensure that the next person who joins up is going to want to be a part of this. Uh, like I, I've got neighbors who live in my neighborhood that I've never even seen. I don't know who lives in the house and you wouldn't want someone like that to come in because that would detract a little bit from the whole experiment. Right. So of the 99 houses, we have 20, we have no sort of say over what happens with those other, what, 79 houses. Um, but if we're, we're advertising or we're putting out the idea that this is for community. I mean, certain people are not going to be attracted to that idea, right? So if if you were if you, Carl, were attracted to this idea and you went and you bought a house and then you decided it wasn't for you, um, is that what you're asking? You, you someone would buy a house, but they really aren't into the community idea, like like Yeah, I'm curious, how do you prevent like the next buyer? How do you maintain the community over time as people move in and out? Okay. Okay. So somebody wanted to move into the community, they did it, they've lived there a few years, they like it, and then they move on for whatever reason. What we would do is we would uh, have an understanding. I mean, I'm sure there's not like a legal thing you could do. It's like, you have to sell your house um, to this person or this way. Um, but I think the understanding would be that uh, if there is demand still for that community, then there are going to people, be people wanting to be part of that community. So we would initially... Um, sort of market it through the co-housing um, thing instead of just going and grabbing a realtor, realtor, and just selling it to anybody. You would, you would, the current owner would make efforts or be expected, I would think, to make efforts to sell it to somebody who would be there for the community. Cool. So maybe you have a waiting list of people to get in there, and 
that actually is beneficial to the seller because they could perhaps avoid a real estate the real estate transaction fees, which can be up to six percent. Right. Yeah, I think that's, and none none of what we will do is going to be like creating the will. I mean, these, like I said earlier, these communities exist a, a lot. I mean, they're all over the place. So, um, so it's just a matter of if we come across something. Uh, that we don't know how we're going to handle. We just reach out to other co-housing communities or do some research and figure out how they handled it and do it. And so a wait list is probably how a lot of people will do that. They'll be, um, I have seen on websites where you can go on there and and check and see if there are available units. Uh, so if you're interested in co-housing and you're like, yeah, this house is available or not available, they might say no housing's available, put yourself on a wait list or a mailing list or something. And then whenever something becomes available, someone gets notified. So uh, I think that's a perfectly reasonable way to do it. But I would imagine that somebody who moved to the community initially uh, for the idea of community, they're not going to be super difficult to work with like, after the fact if they decide it's not for them. But yeah. I don't know that there's anything legally we can like force them to not just right. sell it to some outsider, outsider, whatever. Yep. You mentioned a community house. Is that like owned by the community or can you describe that a little more? Yeah. As I understand it, what we'll do is there has to be some sort of a, a legal entity. Um, in, in our case, it will likely be an HOA, which I know people are like, Ooh, HOA. But the cool thing about this is it's the people in the community that can make up the rules of their own HOA. Currently the neighborhood doesn't have an HOA. Um, so when the time comes, we get X number of people who are interested. They'll all get together sort of, uh, govern themselves and come up with their own rules for the HOA. And the HOA, HOA will own like the community spaces. So right now we have a house that I would imagine is going to be a great uh, house as a community house. And so the HOA, when, gets, when it gets established, will buy the community house and the members will pay into the HOA dues, um, whatever those are to maintain and improve and maintain the community spaces and the, the amenities. Okay. That makes sense. Pretty cool. Can you talk a little about the the cost of the houses? I don't know if you can. Yeah, I mean, I'll give you a range. I think sure. that um, you know that the cost is going to be ultimately determined uh, or negotiated between the buyer and the seller. And so, but I imagine that the range for these houses are going to be from. Seventy-five to a hundred thousand dollars. So, one of the things like I like about this idea is it's an older neighborhood. It's smaller homes. They were built in the late fifties. I don't know if I said that earlier, but they were built in the late fifties. Um, so they're small enough to where if you wanted to do like a complete remodel, it's not going to be super expensive. Um, but they're all. I will say they're all currently habitable and rental properties now. And so, except for the one co-housing. Uh, I'm sorry, the the community house is not. Um, we're going to do basically cut that out and just um, remodel it the way the community feels like it's going to get its best use out of it. But I think that the the cost to get into a house in the neighborhood is going to be between seventy five and one hundred. Okay, so even if they're from the fifties, why is it so damn cheap? This seems uh, weird to me, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. right. So we're in Longmont right now. I think that the real estate here is a little bit different the market here might be a little different than yeah uh, you know middle georgia so all a lot of your listeners are very sophisticated they understand that different regions in our different real estate markets and um, i think a recurring theme is like the midwest and the southeast are typically um like really good rental markets like you can make rental rentals work for you um i don't know why i mean i'm just it's just i'm not a real estate expert but they just are um like i said they're it's an older neighborhood. It's not new construction. They're about 850 square feet to 1,200 square feet, depending on how much uh, how much people have added to the houses. So uh, that's why I gave a range, sort of mm. 75 to to 100 thousand dollars, depending on the size and condition of the house. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, because older neighborhood, because um, of the part of town it could be in. I mean, it's not a terrible part of town or anything like that. Uh, but it is in an affordable part of town versus like brand new construction with the McMansions and all that stuff's going. So um, to me, I think this is a really cool, efficient, low cost way to get the community 
that a lot of people are looking for. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, this is be, would be the least expensive co-housing community like in the country. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. And what, um, what's the draw in Warner Robins? What's around there, like? Well, Warner Robins, um, the city itself, uh, it doesn't have. It's a pretty young city. I think it was kind of originated around World War II. I think we're seventy five years old, something like that. Um, and it was originally like built sort of kind of radiating out, radiating out from a base. And so the city itself, it, from my perspective, it wasn't, uh, wasn't like a planned city. So you don't have like your nice downtown area and all that. It's sort of just kind of like spread out. Um, and it's continuing to spread out South. Um, but what I think Warner Robbins is most known for is the Air Force Base, Robbins Air Force Base right there. Um, so there's a lot of good jobs with defense contractors and things like that. Um, we had a really uh, kind of popular Little League team for a while there. So like ESPN, you know, do the Little League World Series. And so really? Warner Robbins <laughs> team would like had an, the softball and baseball, boys and girls. Uh, they would keep showing up on ESPN. So I remember going out to dinner one time at a restaurant like away from Warner Robbins and was talking to somebody at check checking out and they were like, where y'all from? It's like Warner Robbins. Like, oh yeah, that, that's that's the Little League team. I was like, oh okay, I guess people are knowing it from that. I don't know, <laughs> um, but it's a it's kind of like your it's an eighty thousand person city. I mean, we have population of eighty thousand. The county is about one hundred and sixty thousand. Um, politically, the one at the city itself is kind of split, um, and it's a I would say it's like a mellow kind of a mellow. It's not it's not super. It's not a it's not a rural place um i mean we have it's not like a whole lot of farmland and all that stuff like that it's not I think people sometimes think like they hear co-housing or communities like that they think like, like it's like a commune out in the in the field or something and there's uniforms whatever. right you gotta wear <laughs> yeah. uniforms yeah. yeah well there is that yeah yeah but it's not like that so it's just like a regular neighborhood in a, in a medium-sized city we have all the amenities a normal city would have grocery stores you know movie theaters <laughs> yeah. bowling alleys we actually have a nice like a cool uh new water park oh really i have. used to love yeah. white water up yeah, there and I've never was been, that a cop? Yeah. really i know right oh, man so new water park down there oh and um how far from atlanta it's about an hour and a half south of Atlanta, okay. right down south on I seventy five. So it's like, um, it's like part of the sprawl, basically, right? I so. think that's how a lot of people look at. it. That's not how I look at it because okay. I grew up there, and Atlanta <laughs> is like Atlanta, and then there's yeah. one, like they're separate things. But I think a lot of people sort of look at it like I guess an hour and a half from a big city. Still, the perspective is like some people think that's still kind of like part of the city, I guess. But um, but yeah, about an hour and a half south. Okay, um, and it's it's just a really quick drive to the Atlanta airport. Um, I'll say that it's one of the cool things about Warner Robins is it's centrally located. So um, maybe the city itself doesn't have like like Longmont and Denver where mountains you can hike and all that stuff. But, you know, Georgia state as a whole has a lot to offer. So North Georgia has the mountains. Um, Warner Robins is only uh, two and a half hours away from Savannah. It's an hour and a half south uh, or away from Atlanta and the Atlanta airport. Um, and it's like four hours away from Jacksonville, Florida, maybe five, five and a half hours away from the Gulf. So it's a nice central location uh, for day trips or long weekends, or even if you wanted to use like the co-housing community sort of as a, like a cheaper home base, like a lot of people in the Phi community, they're like, oh, when I reach Phi, I want to travel. I want to go see the world. Um, or they might say, well, I want to uh, have maybe two houses, you know, and kind of chase the good weather a mm -hmm. little bit. Um, so this would be an inexpensive, like a home base. Um, but you can get in and out of easily because like the airport's right there and there's, you know, Atlanta airport's huge. They have plenty of options. Yep. So you live in one of these 20 houses, is that correct? Or It is not correct. Oh. I live about a quarter mile away from this neighborhood. Okay. Uh, and as the community builds, uh, the, I, I will live there if, if it takes off. So you said you have 20 out of 99. What number do you think you have to have to reach a critical mass. And the other question I have is these are, these houses are dispersed throughout these 99 houses. They're not just in one spot. Correct. Um, so co-housing in general, again, from what I've read is the ideal number of units for co-housing is 25 to 35 units. Uh, 
So that's why I always said if we have, we're at 20, I'll go ahead and put the feelers out, see if this is a good idea and see if there's demand for it. Uh, because with the time that it takes to put it out there and for it to form, maybe we'll get five more houses. And so we'll have our 25. But the reason, as I understand it, that range is what it is, is because if you have less than 25 units, maybe the community work doesn't get done because you don't have enough people. And if you have more than 35 units, there's enough, there's more uh, too many people. And you think like any individual might think, well, I don't have to do that because somebody else will do it. So again, it doesn't get done. So that's why that range for 25 to 35. Um, and yeah, they are, they are interspersed. Those 20 that we currently do have are interspersed among the 99. I've focused on one certain side of the neighborhood. Um, and But a number of the houses are currently side by side, might share backyards. Um, and over time, you know, as we get more um, homes, if we do, then, um, you know, it's just logical to think that it's going to be maybe instead of four houses in a row, you have five houses in a row, you know, like that. And eventually it'll fill in. Um, yeah. And, oh, and I will say uh, people who might hear like 99 houses and think like it's a huge neighborhood from walking from like the farthest part of the neighborhood to the other farthest part of the neighborhood. Like that's like five minutes. So it's, it's super walkable and, and it takes no time to get anywhere um, to travel throughout the neighborhood. Cool. Um, coming at this from a Mr. Money Mustache perspective, how walkable or bikeable is the area? Um, it's not super walkable or bikeable. Um, it's probably, I think when people uh, think about Georgia, they don't really like think about the same vibe as say, or Georgia as a whole, I will say, I'm sure there are pockets of Georgia, but you know, they don't think like, um, like Colorado or Denver or Longmont or like bike lanes everywhere or like an outdoorsy vibe or, or, you know, things like that. It's a little bit different. Um, so we do have sidewalks, you know, we, we, you can, uh, <laughs> walk on sidewalks. Uh, the neighborhood is not as a uh, very highly trafficked neighborhood. It's a circle that's sort of closed off with a couple entrances. And, uh, I say closed off, not gated. Uh, but there's only a couple entry roads to the neighborhood. So, uh, it's not, the neighborhood itself is walkable fine. Like there's not a whole lot of car traffic through it. The city as a whole, um, I would say we could we could have some improvement there as far as bike lanes. Uh, but the weather's different too, right? So, you know, you would think like it's a little bit m more humid, more warm climate. Maybe people are not going to bike as much just naturally so maybe that's why the culture is a little different i don't know we'll ask pete about that i think maybe you would <laughs> yeah oh yeah i mean i would like i like yeah, yeah. um but yeah so so we, the culture is a little bit different but yeah. again it's like you know be the change you want to see so right. you know i could i could get up and like once my kids are grown i could just move somewhere else that already has sort of like that culture that vibe that i would i, mm -hmm. I want um uh, or you could just kind of be the change you want to see in the world and and give it a go and and see if you can make where you are a little more mm. like you want it to be. And so that's sort of where I'm leaning now. I'm curious. You mentioned the vibe like in Colorado or the Boulder area and that it's different in Georgia. In one or two words, how do you describe the Georgia vibe? I'm from Georgia for, ev yeah. for everyone uh, to know. So yeah. So one or two words, how do you describe Georgia? <laughs> uh Wow. It's like Coke and Chick-fil-A or something okay, like that. Okay. No, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how you did. You were like, ah, maybe like outdoorsy. Uh. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I, uh, know I mean, it's home yeah. for me. Like, I'm connected. I, I, you know, have a lot of friends and it's, it's just home. Um, so, so for anybody, <laughs> like your listeners, like how would I describe Georgia? I would say that Georgia has a certain reputation, maybe for people who have never been there or spent time there or live there. Mm -hmm. It's not... It's not as bad as you think. I'll say that. What's the <laughs> reputation? I'm going to keep my mouth shut. On that, so. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. I'm just giving you rope here. Yeah, I'm just no, giving you rope to do something. Okay, cool. So, a lot of good, a lot of good people. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, with that said, um, I think we're, we're kind of wrapping up. And I'm curious, like, is there, so you're starting to put out the, the word. So, in, in a few minutes, we'll let you. Describe how you want people to get in touch with you if they're interested and stuff like that, if they want to learn more. But what's like the, 
the timeline and sort of threshold where you're like, okay, we're moving forward. Like how, how fast can stuff happen? And what do you, what are your expectations on that? Uh, well, they could happen as fast as tomorrow. People are you know, <laughs> going to listen to this podcast. They're all going to contact me and say, yes, it sounds like a beautiful thing. We're going to do it. Hook me up with a, with a seller. Let's just make this happen. I'm cool. moving in next week. Yeah. You know, pick Cheap a house, houses. move in, done. Pay cash. Yeah. Um, so that is how fast it could happen. I expect it will happen a little slower than that. Uh, we've, we've, what I've done is I have sent out an email to like the Camp Fi attendees, the Camp Fi community, um, with a questionnaire. Got a great response back. Of those, a certain percentage have actually attended a Zoom call. And so they can actually see each other's faces, know that there's other people interested. Of those people, um, we have like five or six people that are still interested. So, and that's after just one email. So I do think, um, you know, we have like a good start. Uh, and this has just been maybe a month and a half ago. Uh, we do have a good start, but I think the reality is, is um, we'll keep those people engaged with each other uh, through Facebook group or Zoom calls. And at the same time, doing things like this, getting the word out. If people are interested, maybe kind of pull them in, let them meet each other, sort of build community a little slower um, than what it could be. But it's really good because um, the way I see it is maybe over the next year, we'll have enough people that are comfortable with each other. Um, sort of the community is is built up a little bit. The connections are getting stronger among these people who are thinking, yeah, this is a good idea. And I think by the end of next year, like I'll know for sure if it's going to be a thing. Maybe we'll already have a couple of people moved in. Um, maybe not. I don't know. But I'll know by the end of next year uh, if it's going to happen or not. And, and if I feel like it's not going to happen, then there are some really good rental properties for the current owners mm -hmm. like moving forward. Any other questions, Carl? Uh, the one other comment I wanted to say is I was just thinking that's a tremendous bargain if you're a, a FI person. Like to move down there, we could go down there and buy like half the neighborhood, Doug, for what shit costs here in Colorado. Man. Yeah. And just have like a, a place to hang out in the winter when we want to get away. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it really is a good idea for if with the, if the FI minded people, if uh, like if maybe you have a remote job. And so you're not even financially, like it could be a fast track to FI, right? Like you can go, uh, I don't know if y'all have talked about it too much on your podcast, but the, the idea of the Joneses and, you mm -hmm. know, having feeling pressure to, to live a certain lifestyle based on what your or lifestyle based on what your neighbors do and people around you do. So this right here is a way you can, we can redefine the Joneses. Um, you can move there. And uh, if you have a good, a well-paying job, like even if you don't, I mean, it's, it's a low cost of living uh, situation anyway, but uh, especially if you do have like a higher paying remote job, relocate, you know, geo arbitrage there for a number of years. If you get to a point where it's not what you want to do anymore, then at least you can exit that a lot better off or potentially a lot better off financially than you were at the beginning. And you can go buy your beach house or whatever from a position of strength. And uh, instead of, you know, just like getting into debt and spending the rest of your life to pay it off. So, so that's the way I look at it is like people who are either already in Georgia, used to the weather, used to the uh, climate, uh, political climate, all that stuff, you know, that, that's the home for them. Maybe that's something that they're interested in and they, they want to try it out. Um, people who are uh, remote workers, flexible, um, maybe single people who might not already have like their kids in school and, you know, in which they would probably want to stay where they are, which I have kids in school. I completely understand that. Um, you know, people who are just kind of like mobile and just, just come and try it out. And it could be like a fast track to find neighborhood and, and get yourself to a point and maybe you, you want to stay there, which would be great. Um, you can stay there, live full time, stay there, live as like a cheap home base to kind of travel, or you just move on to something different and let someone else take advantage of that. You know what you've done over the, you do the same thing that you've done over the, you know, the past so many years. So it's a, it could be used as, as like a, like a tool to get to fi quicker or to increase your financial situation or improve your financial situation, you know, a little more quickly too. Awesome. Cool. Well, Stephen, this has been fantastic. Where should people find you and more information about the things you're working on, both the co-housing and Camp Fi? Okay. Yeah. So Camp Fi, we have a website, campfi.org. If you're interested in uh, looking at the schedule for the upcoming Camp Fi's, uh, they're all listed right there, probably through next summer right now at this point. Um, and this is summer of 2023 at, at this recording. 
So uh, go to campfire.org, check out the schedule. You can register for events. If you have any questions, you can email at uh, campfire.org at gmail.com. It's campfire.org, O-R-G, at gmail.com. If you're interested in um, the co-housing, which I have tentatively titled Eagle Co-Housing, E-A-G-L-E, Efficient and Generous Living Environment Co-Housing, um, you can go to uh, e- uh, email that address. Uh, the email address is eaglecohousing at gmail.com. So everything's exactly how it sounds. Eagle Cohousing at gmail.com. So cool. those are the two main things that I'm working on. Uh, and if you're interested, yeah, just reach out. All right. Awesome. Yeah, we'll put links for everything so people could check the show notes. So if you're driving or something like that, you don't have to stop right now. And um, Carl, are we, uh, I'm thinking it's like 99% will be at the, uh, you know, week one Rocky Mountain for 2024. Is that right? Yes. I was actually talking to Steven on the way here and I'm going to go home and purchase my ticket. Okay. This cool. Afternoon. Yep. So if you want to hang out with us, we'll be there. Um, so sign up fast is what we're saying. It's going to sell out probably because we're going to be there and uh, yeah, most likely. Right. I think. Yeah, you guys better hurry up and get your tickets because as soon as I hear this, it's going to be done. It's going to be gone. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for having me. It's an honor to be on your show. Thanks for listening to the show. That was the Mile High Five podcast, and I'm Doug Cunnington, the Balder host, and Carl Jensen is the cool, sexy one. If you dig the show, please do three things for us. Number one, tell a friend, a family member, an enemy about the show. We really don't care who you tell. Maybe forward them a specific show that you know that they will like. It's the single most helpful thing that you can do to spread the word. It's like giving us a virtual high five. And uh, actually, we don't give high fives in, in person. So the virtual kind is pretty good. And more importantly, your friend or family member or even your enemy will appreciate the fact that you were thinking of them. Number two, make sure you're following or subscribed on your podcast app. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast, YouTube, whatever you're using, and that way you won't miss a show. And number three, please leave us a rating and review. We read them on the show occasionally, and you might hear yours out there on an upcoming episode. Quick disclaimer, this show is not financial or legal advice. I'd actually be surprised if it sounded like it. It's really just for entertainment, and that's at least what we're hoping for. But seriously, get advice from professionals. Carl and I are just two guys with microphones that sit in my basement and talk. So we'll catch y'all next week. Stephen, what was your favorite meal at Camp Fi, Rocky Mountain? Um, I feel like I should say something funny because you guys are always joking around. So I can't really think of anything funny. But um, I, I like the meatloaf. The meatloaf was good. Okay. And why was my talk your favorite? I just made that up. Yeah. Your talk was absolutely absolutely my favorite, 100%. Best talk of all time that I've ever heard, period. Uh, and why? Um, I had no idea what you were going to say. But it was it was under the 20 minutes um, that was that was recommended for the speakers. And you might be the only speaker that's ever done a talk within that 20 minutes so wow i didn't time it in but i tried to be to purposefully i think i've ignored you in the past and i think i still ignored you most of the time Stephen, because you gave me a slide format i was supposed to use and then we were talking on the way back and i did not use that and so i'm sorry Stephen. i think i caused you pain but the quality of my talk more than made up for your pain maybe probably not. yes more more than made up it's, it's not painful at all um okay. 20 minutes is just a guideline anyway Okay. Am yeah. I off the ban list? Can I attend future camp fives? You are or? allowed to attend future camp fives. Yes, sir. Okay. And what's the screening process for uh, speakers? Uh, well, it's not really a formal process. So it's a combination of, I think the first the first step is if the, if I hear anybody on a podcast or um, if I read something from someone that I think that could provide value to the audience. I'll and as somebody that I would like to either meet or listen to speak selfishly, I might reach out to them and say, "Have you heard of Camp Fi? Would you like to come speak? This is what it's all about." I had pretty good luck with that. Um, and then, as Camp Fi has gotten more popular, I've had people sort of reach out to me more on their own and say, and, and volunteer and and ask me, would I be willing to let them 
speak. Okay, cool. And the main, the main sort of like success metric that you look at, uh, especially with Carl, is like if it's under twenty minutes, shorter the better. Is that? Is that right? No, that's what well, I gathered from the, the season. Well, I don't know how this has happened. Like um, early on, I think we, we basically give an hour. Yeah, you know, yeah, every, yeah, each speaker is responsible for an hour, and um, yeah. So, so I think myself, I have a short attention span, and so I think a twenty-minute speech is a good length um, for for most audience members, so they don't start, so they can maintain their attention the whole time. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's where the twenty minutes come from. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, I love it. I think that's what TED does, right? It has to be like under twenty minutes yeah. or pretty short. Yeah, there's like twelve to eighteen minutes. I think is there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I have seen a couple talks where it's just a little rambling. And it's like an hour and a half and like no one pulled them down or anything like that. So anyway, I'm super tight. I like it. I like the 20 minute time limit. So, okay. I think that's it for the sound check portion. All right.